Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, as a psychiatrist, I've focused on uh, managing and diagnosing the mood disorders for more than four decades. And I guess you could say why. I think the, the first, re first reason is that working with people with mood disorders is extremely rewarding. And the reason is that most mood disorders can be brought under control as long as you get the right diagnosis and provide the optimal management. And so working at that level, the success rate perhaps of maybe 70% is about as good as it gets in any other area of medicine. Secondly, as a clinician to hear a patient say, Doc, I've got my life back, is also about as good as it gets. Next, most people that come my way with a mood disorder are incredibly resilient. And I think there's something about living with a mood disorder that over the years you develop a carapace that sort of makes you incredibly resilient to so many things. You see things in true perspective. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked a man about progress over the uh, period when I'd last seen him. And he said that great Australian phrase, a bit ordinary, Doc. Uh, my wife's developed cancer. I lost my job. Uh, the bank's foreclosing uh, on the mortgage and my dog run over. It's been a bit of an ordinary week, but my mood's been OK. <laughs> so it's a privilege to work with people with mood disorders. Today, I narrow my allotted uh, topic of rural mental health to focus on two particular mood disorders and a strategy for their identification and management in a country centre. And obviously, I'm choosing Orange as a town with a population of about 32,000 people over the age of 16. Before detailing my dream, I need to detail the sad story where depression diagnosis and management has gone wrong. Here, in my challenge to current thinking within the profession, lies my other passion as a dissident, a role that was, uh, I think, nicely articulated by Alan Kohler, who stated that every board or profession should contain a prickly bastard who keeps on asking questions and won't shut up. <laughs> For 2,000 years, psychiatry operated to what's known as a binary model, that essentially there were two classes of depression. One, the quintessential black dog of depression, uh, the biological one that seemed to come from within rather than in relation to life events, so it was often called endogenous. And the other one was called reactive, uh, describing depressions brought on by the vicissitudes and uh, stresses that people faced in life. And in fact, if you go back to St. Paul to the Corinthians, you'll see that binary model echoed. Uh, but it, it actually goes back more than two and a half thousand years. Then 30 years ago, the main classificatory manuals from America and from the World Health Organization moved to a dimensional model, simply positioning depression as a single condition that varies only by severity. That dumbed-down model has set back the diagnosis and treatment of depression. Within the DSM, the American model, there's a category called major depression, a diagnosis that is viewed in and of itself as all explanatory and with cause being absolutely irrelevant. In reality, it's essentially just a domain diagnosis bringing together multiple, diff multiple differing types of depression, all with differing causes, and all deserving quite differing treatments. And so it washes out any signal in regard to cause, any signal in regard to treatment. And that is about as diffuse as you seeing a doctor and being told that you had major breathlessness, which of course might be due to pneumonia or asthma or a pulmonary embolus, and where Respectively, you might anticipate that your doctor would provide an antibiotic or an anti, uh, or a bronchodilator or an anticoagulant. That's the way medicine operates. Subtype, cause, loculated treatment. Similarly, a woman with a breast lump is less interested as to whether it's large or small. The dimensional view is not particularly relevant. She wants to know whether it's benign or malignant and what is the appropriate treatment for that particular pathology. So I would argue that correct treatment and management depends on specifying the condition, 
not just the symptom domain, which is all that major depression captures, and secondly, its causes. So for the depressive disorders, a lack of specificity rules in relation to diagnosis, cause and treatment. Postscript, major depression is actually not that major. All you need is four symptoms, say a depressed mood, fatigue, indecisiveness, poor sleep, and you've got major depression if you have it for a period. I had all those symptoms after the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> non-specific diagnoses then run the risk of leading to non-specific treatment. And that's a com clear consequence of a concept such as major depression. The largest evidence base we have in psychiatry is treatments for depression, for major depression. And that evidence base shows that all treatments tested, whether they're drugs, whether they're psychotherapies, whether they're counselling, whether they're St John's Ward, whether they're even reading books on depression, all come out at about 50%, non-specific finding. And the consequential irony of that is that the treatment that you get for your depression is more shaped by the practitioner that you see, their background and training, than anything to do with the condition. So if you've got major depression or depression X and you see a doctor, you almost certainly get a drug. If you see a psychologist, you'll get cognitive behaviour therapy. If you see a counsellor, you'll get counselling. If you see a lady wearing a caftan, you'll get crystal therapy. That is the reverse way in which medicine should practice. The patient being fitted to the background training or the paradigm of the practitioner rather than the treatment being fitted to the underlying cause and um, origins. There are the serious consequences of the dimensional model. The diagnostic bar for clinical depression has been lowered and thus rates of clinical depression have been inflated to nonsensical levels bringing in normal states of sadness, and even in the last attempt, the American system tried to bring in grief. So there's been an attempt to pathologize normal states. And again, that leads to improper Im and um, less than satisfactory uh, treatment, particularly when medication is prescribed for more normal states. And so I've been a passionate dissident, arguing for paradigms lost to be regained but to enrich the earlier binary model. It was a little bit too simplistic. Again, to identify the primary disorders, their primary causes, and their individual optimal treatments. And I now want to focus on two mood disorders that have preoccupied our research team for decades. Firstly, as I alluded to earlier, melancholia, uh, described initially by Hippocrates two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, this is a patient of mine, she's a very successful lawyer, but when in this severe melancholic state, and in her case it's extremely severe, she can't eat, she can't drink, she can't even lift her head from the pillow. Her mother has to come and bathe her, to feed her, to give her drink, uh, and to even take the lid off her tablet bottle because she lacks the energy to do that. And she said to me, Gordon, I feel as though I've left my brain in a bottle. And that is part of the physical state of melancholia, but also the, the cognitive impairment. And so I want to take you through some of Matthew Johnson's lovely pictures of melancholia. In states like this, um, people keep to themselves. Um, they avoid others. Um, so teenagers don't return uh, anything on their mobile phones. They stay in their bedrooms. They find it hard to get out of bed and even to wash. An interesting feature is that they lose the light in their eyes. I find that a particularly useful one when asking parents, because obviously when you see the patient, they can brush up at the appointment. But loss of light in the eyes, where the eyes almost look like dead fish eyes, is a very common feature of this type of depression. They're often stooped, weighed down, as if carrying the weight of Job. Their voice is monotonous, and their sentences are brief and monosyllabic. They find it hard to be cheered up, and they get no pleasure from life. Their concentration is impaired, not by distractible thoughts, by, by not able to register, by being foggy. So one of my patients said, I normally cook at night, but when I'm in the state, I can't even remember the recipe for an omelette. Melancholia has nothing to do with personality or character. It's an equal opportunity mongrel that can affect anybody, except there is generally a genetic cause. 
And what's going on in melancholia is basically parts of the brain become disconnected and certain neurotransmitters uh, are changed in terms of their actual capacity to function. Melancholia requires antidepressant medication. I raise my eyes to the ceiling often when I hear of a, or see a patient or a patient who tells me that she's been having psychotherapy for 20 years or 30 years uh, when she's not had medication. It does not respond to counselling to therapy. It responds and needs medication. But the key issue here is that despite what the pharmaceutical companies say, and basically they say all antidepressants are equally effective, they are not for melancholia. There are some that are a complete waste of time, some have a 20 to 30% success rate, and some up to 80%. <coughs> and if those antidepressants alone can't bring the condition under control, we have a range of augmenting strategies. So diagnosed properly and logically treated, we can get at least 80% of people out of their episodes and the condition under control. Not cured, but under control. A model like hypertension or type 1 diabetes. Melancholia affects about 4% of the population, which in orange equates to 1,300 people. I estimate that about one half of them would have sought help for their depression, and only about a half of that group would have actually been given an ideal or optimal treatment. So it's likely that there are about 1,000 people in orange who are still dogged by melancholic depression. The second key disorder for focusing on is bipolar disorder. Once it was termed manic depressive illness, but now we divide it into bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Bipolar 2 went under the radar uh, for many years. So what happens uh, with bipolar? People have episodes of melancholic depression and then they have highs. And they oscillate between these highs and the lows. When they're high, they're the life of the party, they're voluble, uh, and they're full of zest. They feel bulletproof and invulnerable and their day-to-day -day worries disappear like snow on a summer's day. They buy things they can't afford, and that is, explains why that uh, TV show that sells tacky jewellery that comes on at three in the morning uh, is so successful. Um, and the other feature, of course, of uh, a high is that people need to sleep very little, and they don't feel tired the next day, so they're up all night uh, doing multiple things, polytasking. And they also become uh, verbally and behaviourally indiscreet. Interestingly, um, and don't tell anyone about this, their libido goes through the roof. And that can create all sorts of problems, as you can imagine, because just about everybody around them is sexually attractive. So the life of a bipolar um, uh, person with a bipolar condition is, I think, well captured by a patient of mine who said, Gordon, when I'm in depression, I get parking fines, and when I'm in a high, I get speeding fines. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, bipolar 2 disorder was only formally diagnosed about 40 years ago, but it's always existed. It was generally misdiagnosed as depression or a personality disorder. It's overrepresented in creative and successful people. Now, the first 51 British prime ministers, 16%, including Winston Churchill, had a bipolar 2 disorder. None ever got diagnosed. Some of them got the diagnosis of depression. Stephen Fry, a good example of a creative uh, person with bipolar 2 disorder and has always been very open about it, unfortunately for a period of time romanticised it. In fact, he called his own condition bipolar light. But in a more recent BBC interview, he noted in describing two serious suicide attempts that one day this condition would kill him. And a key fact is that bipolar 2 disorder has the highest suicide rate of all conditions in psychiatry. In Western countries, most people with a bipolar 2 condition never get the diagnosis. And those that do, the average interval is 10 to 20 years, a period of time where the mood swings can impact on life to an extraordinary degree, but also cause considerable collateral damage in terms of work, relationships, drugs and alcohol, and a whole range of other issues. And yet, bipolar 2 can be brought under very good control with one particular medication working for 60 to 70% of people and with very few side effects. And if that doesn't work, again, we have a range of other options which takes the success rate for bringing the condition under control to again around 80%. The lifetime risk of bipolar 2 is about 3%. 
And that equates to 950 Orange citizens, of whom I would suspect only 10% have ever got the diagnosis or had an appropriate management plan put in place. And that leaves 900 people who would benefit from diagnostic clarification and optimal management. So I estimate that Orange has probably about 2,000 people who've never had their melancholia or bipolar disorder diagnosed accurately or optimally managed. And so here's the dream, to undertake an assessment and targeted intervention program in Orange. We've already developed relevant diagnostic measures at the Black Dog Institute. We have a free online anonymous test for bipolar disorder that is completed anonymously by 50,000 people per month from all over the world. And its screening um, success is 80% equal numbers of false positives and false negatives, but only 20%. So it's very easy to do and it's highly accurate. And we also have another screen for melancholia that again has a similar level of accuracy. So the master plan might involve online screening for all adults in Orange. To ensure high take up, we'd obviously need community leaders to advocate and determine the best strategy. Less ambitious options would be to take a slice of Orange uh, for evaluation maybe a geographical area, or maybe to focus on tertiary education students, or offer online screening to only those who had a mood disorder and wanted clarification and optimal management. For those whose online screening suggested they had a possible or probable uh, melancholia or bipolar disorder, we'd have a cohort of trained Orange GPs to firm up the diagnosis and implement the management plans. For willing participants, we'd measure the severity of the condition, its impact on work, relationships, and other quality of life parameters, and particularly any suicidality. Those not obtaining optimal benefit would need a psychiatry review, and again, that could be put in place. We'd review all participants a year or so later to check on their improvement and whether there'd been demonstrable improvement in quality of life, work, and family relationships. Such a strategy does not address all mental health problems. It's targeted at priority areas, two specific mood disorders, and where there's a high yield in terms of remission and recovery. If taken up by the community, it would put Orange on another map, not just the Australian map, but a global one, as no such public health intervention project has ever been undertaken. Imagine being recognised as the rural region that undertook a world first strategy that saved lives and improved the lives of hundreds more. Imagine.